Good evening. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, everybody. Hey. You're not going to believe what I did. Good to see you. I, no, what? I screwed up Facebook because the oh. last stream I did on here was uh, just on YouTube. And when I put in all oh. the stuff tonight, I forgot to flip the switch to go on Facebook. <laughs> Good evening, oh, well. everyone. So we are completely um, not on Facebook. We are here on YouTube. So good evening. Kim is the mod. Kim, can you do me a favor if you can go to Facebook and just put in the comments that we are on um, YouTube only or I'm going to try. And Jen, what's going on other than my little snafu? Hi. Hi. Well, Hi. I'm I'm surviving the apocalypse nicely. Thank you very much. Uh, sheltering in place and very excited about our show. Very pertinent yeah. stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight. Yep. <clears throat> I, I'm, yeah. I am too. Okay. Well, I'm I'm just making sure that everybody at Facebook knows it's on YouTube only. <laughs> That's all right. I'll share it afterwards. It's just that I know that the Facebook crowd does like to be with us and I screwed up yeah so let's say good evening to antonio's here hi everyone hi antonio. antonio oh good the the pink looks the pink looks good Roz is here Roz is going to be coming well that's he's going to be a special guest um and cb is here and kim's here and zox is here and old sage joe hi hi joe good this is great it's really nice to, and he oh zox says i finally caught one from the start well we've got a a lot to go through and um, whew, I gotta pull it up, Jennifer. Um, I didn't. I didn't set up that screen. Either. <laughs> uh, guys, sometimes. Say what? Okay, I got it. I just wanted to make sure I set up the uh, the internet screen where our stuff is. Everybody can see. Oh, okay. We are actually not starting with that one, but um, we are. It's. It, I'm gonna let Jennifer take it over from me, but we are. What we're doing is big to small, kind of big to small. And <laughs> big to small. yeah, because we have some big news, you know, big stuff that are, is written. And we have David Wallace Wells article that is, you know, when you have a David Wallace Wells article, it's big stuff. And then we're going to play you guys uh, an interview 
with uh, the gal from Colorado State that I'm really excited about because, first of all, Jennifer, she's near you. I think if you could score an interview, it would be great. I know. We should get her on the show. I'm telling you. So yeah. um, Kent's with us. I think Kent's dealing with it. Kent, you're with, you're with us. <laughs> I'm like, Kent. Um, Hi, Kent. Kent. Hi, Ken, and he's saying hi to CB. All right, so we're going to get started, guys, uh, because I, I guess I don't have to say wait for Facebook to join since <laughs> I precluded them from joining. We're and, single stream tonight yeah, single instead stream. of multi-threaded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll, we'll come out better. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All right, so I'm we'll going to pull up the first one, which is the Barron's Observer. And Jennifer, did you want to start off? Because this one we, we thought was an uh, yeah, like an umbrella. This is an umbrella article to kind of get us back into the feel of all this. Right. And I'm checking right. the audio is good. Everything looks great. I haven't screwed anything up yet, Jennifer. <laughs> so let's get going with the article. Absolutely. <clears throat> so this is from the Barents Observer. Mm -hmm. And again, we're up in Siberia. Um, yep. red, red alert for northern Siberia as heat shocks threaten life on tundra. So tonight we're going to be talking about the animals. And we're going to be talking about how all this very like on fire heat, you know, 100 mm -hmm. degree days are are affecting the animals in the Arctic. Yeah, we said that last <clears> week, we <throat> were going to do that. Yeah, and they keep having to invent new colors. So <laughs> new temperature maps for the endless stretches of, Ar of Russian Arctic lands bear witness of unprecedented warming. April 2020 follows in the wake of a number of months with record breaking yeah. The remote tundra lands located along the Arctic Ocean are now among the regions of the world's with the quickest <clears throat> of the world with the quickest warming. Maps of the U.S. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration show deviation from normal temperatures of more than five degrees Celsius. That's pretty big over major parts of Siberia. The visualization depicts average temperature departures in the first four months of 2020 with respect to the 1981 to 2010 period. So Sandy, if you can show that graphic. <clears throat> no, that's good. That's good. Just you got it bigger. Right. Yeah, it's great. So this is the temperature anomaly map, and this is based on the anomaly out of the, uh, what did they say? It was out of the 1981 to 2010 base period. So taking that 30 year period, averaging it, and then seeing how far it's deviating. So 2010, 10 years ago, not that, not that far along ago, right? <clears throat> Nowhere else on the globe are the same kind of dark blood red deviation as in Siberia. The same maps are made available by Russia's meteorolo meteorological service. I'm not going to try it. Shall I try it? Roshdromet. <clears throat> <laughs> I need a course in Russian with all this Arctic... <laughs> I think that would be good. <clears throat> the trend has been going on for many years. Well, we know that every time we talk about the Arctic over the last like six or seven years, it's been red hot. <clears throat> the latest climate report by Rostromut says that average winter temperatures along the northern sea route, the waters located along the country's Arctic coast have increased by about five degrees. The water, the average temperature of the water has increased about five degrees since the 1990s. 
that's yeah. huge. So it's it's really hitting the water and the land both. <clears throat> the warming is most significant in the areas around the Kara Sea. The report reads, I just have to keep thinking of all the nuclear testing that they did up in that little Arctic land right. um, island. And in the Kara Sea, I, I don't think that that helped matters any. Right. No, it right. didn't. It didn't. Yeah. No. The extraordinary heat continues into spring. Temperature maps from Rostromat show that another heat wave in mid-May swept over the region. In parts of northern Siberia, including the remote <coughs> Arctic peninsula of Yamal, mm -hmm. Gaidan, and Tamir, the average temperature on the 23rd of May were as much as 16 degrees Celsius higher than normal. Abby normal. That graph. Yeah, people were oh, saying yeah. that I there was no sound from me for a minute. It was I, oh, I right? muted myself purposely so I didn't slurp my coffee in my in your ears because <laughs> I was <laughs> I listened to myself back last week and I I was slurping <laughs> coffee. <laughs> So now I'm very, very much, you know, <laughs> worried about my slurp adelic yeah. sound. Slurp factor. Yeah, this, uh, there you go, slurp factor. Sine par kav, sine par kav. it's just fine. <laughs> okay, let us continue. Yes. The warm weather and early spring has created a record early ice breakup of several of the great Siberian rivers, among them oh. the Yenisei. At the same time, the high temperatures have prepared the ground for unprecedented early wildfires. Oh, this is so scary because mm. there's all that peat up there, right? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. You know? Authorities in the Yamal Nets region, Yamal Net Nenets region, Nenets. inform <laughs> Yamal okay, Nenets. Hans. Everybody knows we're going to do this. <laughs> Um, informed that they are already combating as many as seven fires. There's big wow. changes in the tundra. Do you want to take this part, the big changes wow. in the tundra? Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me find it. Find where I am. Okay, big changes on the tundra. So, those high temperatures have a major effect on the ecosystems, which, Jen, is what we were trying to get to. And by the way, mm -hmm. as an aside... It wasn't easy to find anything about what's going on with the uh, ecosystem in uh, Siberia at this time. I didn't have enough time to delve into university research on species, which mm -hmm. I would have liked, but it's it was not easy. And of course, you know, there's other things that were going on, so I didn't have time. But if anybody has yeah. anything, anything that's more um, a little more academic, send it along for us. Okay, so... Uh, Normally, the formation of a drained lake is a pretty extensive and gradual process that takes several decades, said the head of research project, Sergei Loiko. But in this case, everything happens several, ten times quicker. Now I'm going to do him. Several, several ten, ten times. times. That's yes. like 40 times quicker. Yes. Several being four and ten yes. being ten. Yes. Ten yes. times four and is 40. Yep. That's like huge. Yes, it's huge. When a research yeah. team from that university was in the region in 2016, a lake disappeared in just a few weeks, the university mm. writes on its website. So 2016 was so far the warmest on record. But the following years have been only slightly colder. According to uh, Rosh Dromet, 2019 was the second warmest year in the Arctic since measurements started in 36. I wonder if there was anything before that at all. Mm. Hmm. The higher temperatures are accompanied by a rapid growth of vegetation and greeting of the region. So this trend is very clear for indigenous people in the area, the researchers say. Oh my gosh. Over the last decades, they have seen a significant change of local biodiversity and the appearance of grass and new kinds of insects. Hmm. Hmm, that's going to be And we're going to be talking about that too. Yes, we are. Uh, Expansion of the industry. The Arctic warming is evident also for the Russian shipping industry that over the last years has been able to make it across uh, the Arctic waters easier than any time before. So supported by lighter ice conditions in the area, ships in 2019 transported 
five million tons of goods on the northern sea route. And that's an increase of almost 60% from the uh, previous year. Oh, boy. See, that bugs yeah, me. They're just and- going to be bearing a track across I agree. the Arctic Ocean. And by the way, you know, there was something else going on uh, mm-hmm. about in the news how the Russians are in, they're, they're near the, uh, they're near Alaska, or they're near the, Ar- the a, di- a part of the Arctic that's not theirs. And of course, the news isn't telling us anything cohesive that we can hang on to they're trying to make it like it's you know oh we're running up to some kind of uh war or and i'm looking at this like do you ever think these are research vessels we're not hearing the truth and or research planes and they're trying to look at what's going on in the arctic so that they can report back to their government cha-ching 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 That's all they want. You know, they want to make the money by using the shipping lanes. So nobody thought of that. I mean, that I've read in the media saying, hey, maybe this is what is going on. Russia stands to make a lot of money from this melt if if we don't, uh, you know, destroy the ecosystem first. So basically, they had a LNG carrier, the Christophe de Marjorie, uh, set out from Arctic Seaport, Sabetta, in Yamal, Yamal, with the course for the eastern part of the northern sea route. The eastbound voyage on the route is this year's first of a kind, and it comes a month earlier than the previous year's, Jennifer. So a few days later, the carrier... Yep, yep. So that's what's going on. There's an... And they said that the sister ship, Vladimir Voronin, that now is entering melting Arctic sea ice with the course for China. So this is where we are. This is where Mm -hmm. we are. It's kind of shitty <laughs> to, to it's be where we really are. It's really shitty. Yeah, it's, it's really a, shitty. It's real shitty. It's just, it's horrible. It's it's being destroyed all <sighs> around us. I know. Well, the chat's having a so good old horrible. time in there. Um, Tony, they, we were asking Antonio, he said ecosystems are ex- experience a lot of damage. And uh, somebody, Trish says, Antonio, how long do you think we have? Oh, my God. I, I don't want to go there, but I see what <laughs> the, con- you know, I mean, it was a do me, a do me intro. You know, I mean, it, you when you read all this stuff, you just realize that nobody wants to realize Jennifer, except our crowd and a few others were trying to educate how important this is and how critical it is to understand it's All right. so important to understand this. I know. It I really, know. really is. Well, so there's another article, Sandy, yeah. that just came out yesterday, right? In David the Wallace New York Wells. Magazine. Yep. In Take the Intelligencer column. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> David Wallace Wells. What a great writer he is. He's so good, guys. He's done so much for activism in general. He really has. Oh, he's just amazing. Global warming is melting our sense of time. This is a big, a long one. So we don't know if it we is. can get through the maybe, whole thing. Maybe but. we can um, switch it off a little bit because it's kind of going to be a bit too much for me to bite off. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and we'll see how long it takes because we have so much to go over. I know. We might not get through it, but we'll try. Right. We'll, we'll okay. get through as much as we can. All righty. So, hot off the press, guys. Hot off the press, guys. <laughs> okay. On June 20th, the small Siberian town of Verkoyansk, north of the Arctic Circle, a heat wave baking the region peaked at 38 degrees Celsius, just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It was the highest temperature ever recorded in the Arctic. That's a statement, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, every day is a, a record. And every is... day, every day. And it's not just, oh, it got, it's got it gone up yeah. to 100 point whatever, and it did that in 1915. Yeah, for one day, you know, back in that. But no, if, if they, consistent. yeah. Yeah. This is consistent. In a world without climate change, this anomaly, one Danish meteorologist calculated, would be a one in 100,000 year event. Thanks to climate change, that year is now. If you saw the news last weekend, it was probably only a glimpse. But the overwhelming coverage of perhaps 
more immediately pressing events, global protests, global pandemic, economic calamity, is only Lovely. one reason for that climate occlusion. The extreme weather of the last few summers has already inured us to temperature anomalies like these. Mm. Though we are only at the beginning of the livable planet's transformation by climate change. We're just getting started. Right. That's sad. Yeah. Yeah, a transformation whose end is not yet visible, meaning like we've started, but we have no idea when it's going to end, if it will ever be, and in which departures from historical record will grow only more dramatic and more disorienting mm. and more lethal almost by the year at just 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming, awesome. where the planet is today, <laughs> mm -hmm. could be more. <clears throat> oh, I got we it. have already, yeah, we have already evicted ourselves from the human climate niche and brought ourselves outside the range of global temperatures that enclose the entire history of human civilization. That history is roughly 10,000 years long, which means that in a stable climate, you would only expect to encounter an anomaly like this one if you ran the full lifespan of all recorded human history 10 times over wow. and even then would only encounter it once. So what he's saying, yeah. this is a once in a hundred thousand year event. <clears throat> Get a handle on it. Chris, human Definitely. civilization is only 10,000 years long. So he's saying it's at least 10, 10 times longer than that. It's crazy. <clears throat> you may register temperature records like these merely as the sign of the new normal in which record-breaking heat waves fade out of newsworthiness and into routine. But the fact of those records doesn't mean only that change has arrived because the records are not being set only once. In many cases, they are being set annually. True. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. The city of Houston, for instance, has been hit by five 500-year storms in the last five years. Do the math. That doesn't make sense, right? This today is hard. <laughs> and while the term has obviously lost some of its descriptive pre precision in a time of climate change, it's worth remembering that it was originally meant to convey a storm that has a one in 500 chance of arriving in any given year. Mm. Well, jeez. Pretty he heavy. He's he's really he's socking it to you just like he does. I know, he does. He does. Yeah. He does. And could therefore be expected once in five centuries. How long is that time span, the natural historical context for a storm like that? 500 years ago, Europeans had not yet arrived on American shores. So we are talking about a storm that we would expect to hit just once in that entire history. And we had one every in the last five years in Houston. Utterly amazing. The history of European settlement and genocide good job, Europeans, of the war for independence and the building of a slave empire. Good Ugh. job, guys. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I mean, honestly. Karma, he really went please. through and he, he really said what we are. He said oh, what yeah. this, what no. this, this what, basically spelled it out. It's Jen. this culture. It's this fucking culture. There you go. It's a slave. It's a slave empire. <laughs> At the end of that empire, through civil war of industrialization and Jim Crow and World War I and World War II, the Cold War and the age of the American empire, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, the end of the Cold War and the end of history, September 11th and 2008. Woo. Yeah. Woo. One storm. <laughs> yeah. One storm of this scale in all that time is what meteorological History tells us to expect. Well, expect the unexpected. That's what I say. Well, I do even here. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot different Houston here. Has been, Houston has been hit by five of them in the last five years and may be hit with another this summer. 
which is already predicted to be a hurricane season of unusual intensity. Holy crap, hang on to your hats. Of course, that won't be the end of the transformations. Climate change will continue. And those records, high temperatures, historic rainfall, drought, wind speed, and all the rest will continue to fall. From here, literally everything that follows climate-wise will literally be unprecedented. That's right. And we hey, there's a nice graphic there, Sandy. Do you see that map? Yeah, I've got it up. I just don't yeah. know. If, I'm I not going to click on it because I don't think it's Look at those blisters of bigger. red. I mean, Siberia Everywhere. is just it's, on fire. It's awful. And it's, on it's fire, literally, a, yeah. But it, it, it yeah. is on fire, literally. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. is. Well, there are we, seven we, fires remember that in other, right now? Seven of them? Well, the other research yeah. that we were going to look at, but it, it was too, like, academic-y to, to go over, but it was uh, on the tipping points and how, you know, basically yeah. uh, <laughs> ecological tipping points are us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So the Arctic numbers from June 20th are terrifying enough. With more context, they become only more so. It was warmer there than it was that same day in Miami, Florida. Oh, no. Yes. It was warmer in Siberia in the Arctic than it was in Miami, Florida. Yeah, they were actually wearing day. bikinis in some of the pictures, These the, the people. I mean, <laughs> where did they get a bikini? But, yep. No. They made it. In fact, it was warmer north of the Arctic Circle than it has ever been on any June day in the entire recorded history of Miami, which has only once in the tropical century for which temperatures have been registered reached 100. I didn't know that. So Miami only reached 100 once. That's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. I was kind it of was about look for something else on that one because I was kind of surprised. Yeah. It was about 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in Fort Klyansk than the average high temperature in the region for June, which means the Arctic record was the equivalent in terms of temperature anomaly of 110 degrees June day in New York City or 115 degree June day in Washington, D.C. Mm. According to preliminary satellite data, land surface temperature parts in <clears throat> in parts of the arctic siberia reached that level last week too 45 yeah. degrees or 113 degrees oh, fahrenheit shit. in terms of, this is freaking scary it's, it's, in terms of temperature yeah. anomaly that's the equivalent of a 130 degree day in dc on capitol hill that would be comfortably lethal heat yep Maybe that's why I made that opening video as doomy as it was. I, think, I liked your opening video. I thought it, it kind of revealed great. my thoughts. This yeah. has to be out in the. Nobody talk. This is not on freaking MSDNC. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't think they talk about any of this, and this is this is so important. This is critical mm -hmm. world news. Oh, this is the age of distraction. No, oh, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, this is the age of distraction and diffraction and diffusion, and let's not look at the facts. Yeah, right? well, there's all that. I guess we're going to do, we'll, we could do a show <clears throat> together on the issue of now scientists, like Kevin Anderson mm -hmm. had said, how scientists are now not, they're, they're kind of sugarcoating things or they're afraid to tell the truth. That's a whole yeah. thing out there. Yeah, That is a whole thing. We can do a show on that. Yeah, it would be, I think it would be a yeah. good one. Yeah. Thankfully, for Americans at least, this isn't how global warming works. Its punishing effects are distributed unequally around the globe. And the moment, at the moment, the Arctic is being punished most vindictively, warming at least three times the rate of the rest of the planet. I love the way David Wallace Wells writes. So do you? I. It's like, well, if we wrote... We would be reinventing the wheel when he's got everything in there and we can just narrate it. I know. He's, he's, such, he's such an eloquent writer. He and is. he's really driving the point home. I've noticed that David Wallace Wells has gotten more doomy in the last few years. Haven't you noticed that? Uh, yes, I did. The really? last time I saw him on a talk right? show, 
that was a mainstream talk show, he was actually quite controversial for them, I thought. Yeah. I'd have to find the yeah. clip on YouTube, but uh, okay, where are we? <laughs> in Siberia in May, temperatures averaged as much as 10 degrees Celsius higher than normal. The arrival of the Arctic summer reignited zombie fires oh that God. had improbably burned throughout the Arctic winter, smoldering in peat rather than burning out. This is oh what God. we're talking about. Yeah. The, the Arctic's literally on fire. <clears throat> Those fires, like all fires, release carbon, which is stored in trees as surely as in coal. In this case, releasing as much CO2 in the last 18 months as had been produced by Siberian wildfires in the last 16 years. years. Oh, my God. Think how much worse the problem's getting. Yeah. So even though we had a shutdown because of coronavirus, this is this is like so. It, it seems like it's going to be negated, and it's going to be in in the memory books for that little three oh, month yeah. stint. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. In early June, an industrial scale oil storage facility there collapsed. That's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. When the melting permafrost on which it had been built finally destabilized, releasing about 21,000 tons of oil and turning local rivers red. red. That spill yeah. was about two-thirds the scale of the Exxon Valdez, which horrified an entire generation. This one we've hardly read about, though it befell a far more ecologically degraded planet with more than half of all carbon emissions ever produced by burning fossil fuels in the entire history of humanity coming since the Valdez spill. Wow, God, he has heavy. good statistics. Yeah, he does. Well, he's got the money oh, behind him God. to get the statistics, so we'll just glom off him. We don't get paid by the, the oh, intelligence. He's, right. <laughs> he's really good. <laughs> yeah, he's but we really were reporting good. this. People weren't. We were. I think oh, we yeah. were one of the first these kind of channels to report on this. Oh, yeah, the, the, totally. the spill. Mm. We definitely were. Perhaps, though, a less precise word than because the intervening generation of environmental calamity having quite thoroughly normalized horrors like these, that's the, it becomes normal, mm -hmm. right? Normalized, yeah. Even Vladimir Putin presiding the poobah himself <laughs> over Petro State, Uba. which so far north actually stands to benefit from some of the amount of global warming, of declared it an emergency. So even Vladimir. Yeah. All told, the planet's melting permafrost contains twice as much carbon as hangs in the planet's atmosphere today. Right. God. I know. Oh, okay. And it's expected that over the course of the century, at least 100 billion tons of it will be released through melt, about three years worth of global emissions and functionally enough to close the window on the goals of the Paris Accords. Boy, he just puts it in no time. You know, funny, to, uh, yeah. Jen, I was talking to my mother today. She had read this. And she's 86, yeah. and she said, the whole world is going crazy, Sandy. I said, Mom, you've lived through so much, yeah. and the, the war, and then Vietnam. I mean, she's 86, and this is, oh. she just is incredulous at what she's saying. She can't believe it, and she's very upset about the Arctic. And, you know, I remember when David came out with his first article. Remember the first one? The, the, the yeah. what was it called? The, the something, the doomed earth? I've... Oh, yeah. Well, okay. first there was Hot House Earth, and then That's there it. was... Uh, the first one. There was another one. Yep. I but can't my remember. Mom well, David said... Wallace Wells is one like two years ago. It was really, really yeah, good. That's I can't what remember my mother what said, now. Sandy. She said, Sandy, you were right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Ma. What do you, you think know what? Sandy, that's what happened to me, too. My dad called me up and he said, Jen, you got to read the New York Times. Oh my There's God. a great article. It's like what you've been saying. That's what it's they did. It's got the feedbacks. It's got the albedo. It's mm -hmm. got everything. It's happening now. And I'm like, yep, that's right, Dad. That's it is. It's what happening my mother now. said. 
Isn't it amazing how many, yeah, but, and then I thought about her today and I'm thinking, well, she's 86. She's yeah. seeing all this and she knows she's not going to have to deal with the, the bullshit. You know, my daughter is not either because, well, she's not going to have kids, you know, so she's, what the hell? All right. Where yeah. are we? But thank you for that little, I sometimes like to go on the aside. That was yeah. interesting that your family did the same thing as mine. Yeah. Holy shit. Exactly the same thing. And gave so us right validation. Pretty little picture with the branch on yep. it. There's an that window is that that's where it is. Okay. All right. So that window was not open very far to begin with. One recent study suggested that even the decarbonization targets of Britain and Sweden, often hailed as global climate leaders, would produce emissions of between two and three times the carbon budget required to meet the Paris goals. And those are just their decarbonization plans, which are probably optimistic. Another analysis suggested that for all the talk of having our emissions by 2030, as the IPCC says, is necessarily is necessary to safely avoid two degrees of warming, the planet has only a 0.3% chance of doing so. So if Donald Trump won re-election, the analysis suggested pretty much those chances would fall to 0.1%, one in a thousand. In other words, WASF. And that's what I keep saying. <laughs> if two degrees... That's right. Uh, if two... Uh, I hate to be this way tonight, but it's like there's nothing. <laughs> if two degrees it's is happening. now in, yeah, it's happening is now inevitable, that doesn't make it comfortable. Indeed, it will be for much of the world a horror. And the space between those two things, inevitability and horror, is the one in which we will be forced to learn to live. At two degrees, it's expected that more than 150 million additional people would die from the effects of pollution storms that used to arrive once every century would hit every single year and that lands that are today home to 1.5 billion people would become literally uninhabitable at least by the standards of human history this is new york magazine again this oh, is yeah. not sensationalism oh, yeah. and this is not alarmism those no, projections, because they facts. right, and they they wouldn't have him writing if they were cut, you know, didn't somebody has to tell the fucking truth. So those projections will invariably pr prove imprecise and perhaps worse. That is both the nature of science, which proceeds by revision, and humanity, which will likely adapt to at least some measure of these impacts. But the Siberian heat wave reminds us just how large the scale of necessary adaptation will likely be, requiring us to respond not just by shoring up the proverbial shorelines of our civilizations, but by preparing them in much more fundamental ways to endure conditions never seen before in the whole span of human history. It uh. is also a reminder of just how much we miss when we regard the projections of any neat linear model of future warming as a straightforward prediction of that future and of what level of adaptation will be will, will be required especially when we reflexively discount the uncertainty warnings scientists invariably include you know the uncertainty warnings hey we're uncertain but it's happening mm -hmm. um and the important lesson let me get back to where i was the important lesson of the uh uh freakish siberian heat wave it's however terrifyingly fine you will find projections of future warming the actual experience of living on a heated planet will be considerably more unpredictable and disorienting just how freakish mm -hmm. freakish right just how freakish mm -hmm. and uh un predicted is this heat wave over the last few years a growing chorus of critics have argued against one climate model built on predictions of high-end carbon emissions in particular called rcp 8.5 i think we had discussed that once before too arguing that though it had been endorsed by the un's ipcc and formed the basis of much recent science since that organization's last major report, its project projections were simply implausible, relying, relying as they did on the dramatic growth of coal use over the course of the century. 
As I've written before, he says, that pathway does indeed look increasingly hard to credit as a model of our future, and it is best understood in terms of emissions as an absolute worst-case scenario, and that would require almost a global climate nihilism to achieve. But for those suggesting we should discard that model or any other that charted a high-end course for warming, the Arctic heat wave makes a very strong counter-argument. But even in the worst-case pathway, 100-degree summer days in the Arctic do not become routine until the very end of the century. Okay, is he copping out? <laughs> this heat wave. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, he's going by his, the models, right? But it's bad enough. That's what he's saying, right? It, it's the worst case. But we're in there, kind of. This heat wave is today an outlier, not a routine event. But that doesn't make it irrelevant. Instead, it is giving us at least a brief preview of what the world would look like more than half a century from now. In a timeline we understand to be, at least in terms of emissions, impossibly pessimistic. But if our timeline could accommodate such extreme events from that worst case one and decades ahead of schedule, it is also a sign that timeline is probably a misguided way of thinking about the new swirling universe of extreme events we are plunging headlong into. It's kind of like a, a, a you know being on a, a roller coaster here. That's how it, it's really mm -hmm. how it feels. Um, he said, making sense of climate change requires more than trying to determine where on a particular linear plot we are and where on it we are likely to be in 10 years or in 50. Well, that's why the Polish stern is up there. It's because it's not linear. It's nonlinear. Right. It's want Should we go through this whole rest of, or should everybody else? Well, it's really I'm looking long. at the time, and yeah. if we do this whole article, we'll never get I think to get what to the we other. should do, because this is huge article, and yes. it's going on and on. This is a really good article. Oh, of by the way, Sandy, it, it was the uninhabitable, That's it. uninhabitable Earth. Earth. That was that was the one that David Wallace Wells wrote, like, I think almost two years ago, right? Yes, that's and, the one uh, my mother freaked out. He's a really good writer. So Sandy's going to have this in the show of notes. Course. But I think you're right. I think it's we long, should. Uh, but you, we get should... The, you guys get the drift of what we're saying with the, what he's saying in this article. He got, you know, uh, of course, they always back off a little bit. Cause, but you see, I do believe we do have, I mean, 2050 is not far. I mean, we're going to fuck it all up. We've already fucked it all up. Mm. So, okay. Mm. What we're going to do now, guys is actually we're going to there's a a professor in Boulder and we're going to play a video and it's from PBS and it's and then we're going to interact with you guys in the chat while the video's playing I think I'm going to try to fast forward through a little bit of it but it's really good when we thought you know what Dr. Merritt Turetsky director of the Institute of Arc and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado Boulder. She has studied the Arctic for decades. So we thought that it would really be a, a, an interesting, just to play the clip for you, instead of us trying to interpret what she said and, and, and use her yeah. to articulate. She's a scientist and it would be just so exciting. We are citizen scientists. Yeah. She's a trained scientist, but we are citizen yeah. scientists. So... We're going to stay in the and play in the chat with you guys while this is on. And I'm going yeah. to put it on. And right, uh, right now, it should work. There is a heat wave of historic proportions occurring in the Arctic right now, a region that is already the fastest warming place on Earth due to the increasing buildup of greenhouse gases. William Brangham talks with a scientist who's worked in the region for decades. That's right, Judy. It is summer in the Arctic right now, so somewhat milder temperatures would be expected. But this heat wave, which has triggered huge wildfires in Siberia and increased melting of the permafrost, are likely the warmest temperatures ever recorded, and now are only going to make climate change worse. Dr. Merritt Turetsky is the director of the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she joins me from a cabin in Canada. Dr. Turetsky, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. 
Can you just help us understand what is going on in the Arctic right now? What is driving this intense heat wave? Let me start with an analogy. So when we come down with a fever, when our bodies spike a temperature, we stop, we realize that there's a problem, and we provide care. And that's exactly what's happening today. The Arctic is feverish, with temperatures um, spiking above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in multiple locations. So these extreme temperatures are very unusual. They are record-breaking. But this is part of a longer-term trend. In fact, last year, last summer, was a very warm period in the Arctic, and Siberia and parts of Russia experienced the warmest winter on record. And it's part of a trend that we anticipate will become more frequent in the Arctic because of climate change. And so I understand there's also, there's a high pressure system, I guess, over the Arctic, which is making this particular issue. But you're, you're saying that the longer term trend of a warming atmosphere is really being felt in the Arctic very sharply. That's exactly right. So this is part of a persistent warming trend, but at the same time, the best tools that we have at our disposal in the scientific community, our climate models, predict more extreme conditions. And this is true all around the world. We're seeing more extreme conditions in storms, more extreme conditions in precipitation. And that's the same in the Arctic. We're seeing more extreme temperature changes, and this is consistent with our predictions into the future. So what are some of the impacts of that? I mean, for people who might look at this and think, I don't live in the Arctic. The Arctic is very far away from me. What are some of the consequences of this warming trend in the Arctic? These Arctic changes will affect everyone on the globe for a number of reasons. The first is that, you know, when the Arctic is warm, it changes weather patterns all around the world. The heat wave is triggering very rapid wildfires. And, you know, the Arctic is literally and figuratively on fire. And this is likely to get worse as this heat wave continues through the summer. The emissions from those wildfires, of course, release greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So that affects climate of the entire planet through the greenhouse gas effect. But the emissions from wildfires also affect air quality. These smoke plumes don't stay in the Arctic. They drift globally with atmospheric circulation. Last summer when the Arctic was set on fire because of warm conditions, uh, smoke plumes reached the Western United States and affected air quality for millions of people. So these Impacts in the Arctic are very strong locally. There are many people who live in the Arctic who depend on stable, frozen ground. They, of course, are impacted. I mentioned also that there is the, the warming and melting of the permafrost. For people who may not be familiar with what permafrost is and why its melting could impact climate change as well, can you explain that? Permafrost is the glue of Arctic ecosystems. It is literally the backbone upon which all of the soils and the vegetation and the animals in the Arctic depend upon. Permafrost is frozen ground, so it can be frozen rock, frozen soil, frozen sediment. It's defined by its temperature. And the Arctic today is shaped by permafrost. But we are seeing widespread evidence on multiple continents in the Arctic that permafrost is thawing as a result of climate change. And in many places, this can cause catastrophic impacts on the landscape. Lakes can literally disappear in the period of a few weeks. These are lakes that have been used as fishing grounds for generations, and they simply disappear because the permafrost thaws and it's like pulling the plug out of a bathtub. All the water is allowed to drain away. Permafrost is very important not only to supporting life in the Arctic, but it's important for storing carbon. It's been keeping carbon out of the atmosphere and benefiting climate for thousands and thousands of years. But once permafrost thaws, that carbon is now vulnerable to microbial decomposition and it can be re-released into the atmosphere. Its fate is unknown and scientists are trying to figure out just how much of that carbon will wind up in the atmosphere and what impacts it will have on our climate. 
All right, such an important topic. Dr. Mara Tureski, thank you very, very much for your insight. Thank you. There is a... Well, that was pretty good. That was, uh, I thought that she was good. I, I, I liked her, uh, her feverish, you know, I just liked it. And, uh, I'm really glad that, that you guys, uh, got to hear her. Yep. And maybe we can. So we're going to segue. I mean, she said important, you know, it was important. I liked the way she described it. Jen, if you you know, ever yeah. happen to bump in her somewhere. Oh, right. Be like, yeah. really in my cool. my seclusion, I'm sure I'll bump <laughs> into her. <laughs> I could try and see if we could get her on Zoom, though, you know. Maybe, yeah. Interview. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be great. Well, now, guys, we are going to segue to animals. We're going to discuss something. I wanted to do this one. Um, we're going to discuss this. Here, let me get it up. All right. This is... The WWF, World Wildlife Federation. And the reason why I pulled this up is, you know, it's a big green, but I pulled it up because they're going, they talk about the Arctic species affected by climate change. And of course, they're always going to talk about the species that have name recognition, the species that we all know and love. And we'll go over those quickly. And then we're going to go into the littler ones that we found and the littler ones sometimes are just as heartbreaking as the big ones knowing that they're going and the first one that they had in this article was the walrus and uh we see how beautiful they are they're huge and these the, the walruses can weigh over a ton and both sexes sport impressive tusks but they use the sea ice as a platform for resting and a place to leave young calves while they're diving for food. But loss of their sea ice habitat is forcing larger numbers ashore. On land, they're highly susceptible to disturbance from people, aircraft, and predators such as polar bears, which can spook them and cause crushing stampedes. And I've seen videos of that. Where really? planes, yes, I know that it, and I, it's, it is. And then reindeer, you know, the reindeer. You think that that deer are, are invincible. Uh, reindeer, in, and they're the only deer where both males and females have the antlers. Reindeer, only, they both do. And their numbers across the Arctic have fallen by more than half in 20 years. They survive by migrating to find food, using their hooves to dig through the snow to eat the nu nutritious lichen buried underneath. But climate change means herds must swim across previously frozen rivers and many young calves drown. And rising oh. temperatures mean more rain, uh, covering plants with ice instead of snow, making grazing harder. I mean, it's, it's just, it's heartbreaking, but it's happening. And you hope that they will adapt and you hope that they will, that, you know, that, that, that it will, if evolution will take place, but you know, it's, it's, that's good. We're not going to see it. The Semmer ring seal in the Southeast of Finland lies a vast ancient lake, Lake Sema, the only home to around 380 Sema ring seals. They're dependent on the lake's ice and snowy surface in winter when it's time to give birth and raise their pups. Over the past several years, the snow cover on the lake hasn't been deep enough for the seals to build their birthing dens, posing a huge risk to the future of this species. So, uh -oh. they're beautiful, and it's happening. They are. But we want to so bring, beautiful. and you know, we bring it to you, not to depress you, but to educate you, because the shit's happening, and it's, you know, you're going to sit, you can sit with your head in the sand and be an ostrich, but I'm not. And those of you with us are not either. Uh, There's no ostriches here. <laughs> no ostriches on this bus. So polar bears, we all know about polar bears, and they depend on the sea ice to travel, hunt seals, and find mates. And as the sea ice decreases, many will be forced to travel further for food and spend time on land. And, of course, humans will interrupt with that shit. Less access to food will affect survival, particularly of cubs and young bears. And longer periods fasting on land will increase the likelihood of encounters with people. So we're going to lose the – we're going to – and now, see, this is where I don't – 
where there's statistics. We could lose more than 30% of the world's polar bears by 2050. I think that's a long time. I looked at when I did my live stream on elephants, I did my show on elephants. They're going faster than that in uh, Africa. I think that's really uh, optimistic. Um, the narwhals, they're the unicorns of the sea. And most males and even some females have beautiful spiraling tusks, which can be up to three millimeters. Well, three what? And millimeters long. Three meters long. Meters long, long not millimeters. Meters long. Oh, that's nine feet. That's like ten yeah, feet big, long almost. Yeah, big, huge, long. Yeah. Okay, I have to see what I'm reading here. <laughs> Narwhals are totally adapted to living amongst thick sea ice. They evolved without a dorsal fin, allowing them to travel closely under ice to take refuge from faster predators. But with sea ice melting earlier, predators like orcas can potentially access new areas that they previously couldn't because of the large dorsal fin. And they hunt the narwhal, even with their big thing, with their big horn. Uh, melting sea ice is opening the door for more industrial activity and shipping and noise from which can cause hearing loss, increase stress, reduce the ability to communicate and even scare away fish. Now here's a little, this one really is, a, it's, look how beautiful this is. We, we all have He's to just, so cute. And we all What's have that, to a feel, little arctic fox? Yes, we have to feel lucky that, you know, we're, 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 we may never get to see them, but at least we can see them this way. You know, those people that get up and get to do this photography, they're, they're, they're so lucky that they can do this work. These beautiful creatures have an entirely white coat in winter to camouflage them in snow. Climate change is extending the range, now this is interesting, of red foxes. So the tree line is moving further north as the tundra retreats. So they're increasingly crossing paths with their tundra-dwelling relatives, Arctic foxes. Red foxes are twice the size of Arctic foxes and not only compete for their prey, but can take their dens by killing or chasing them away. So mm. it's the survival of the fittest. But in this case, it's hastened by climate change. This would not have been naturally occurring in this faster than it previously expected time period. And the orcas, mm -hmm. the killer whales, are actually the world's biggest dolphin. They live in close-knit, lifelong pods, and over the last decade, warmer summers and less sea ice has meant orcas are able to access new areas of the Arctic, visit earlier and stay for longer, hunting Arctic species such as the narwhals, due in part to a large dorsal fin and unfamiliarity with the territory. Orcas can become trapped in sea ice and die of starvation. However, in regions where sea ice continues to shrink and be replaced with open water for longer periods, it is possible that orcas will take over from polar bears as the top predator. And then the lemming. Everybody, remember how people use the lemming? It's like, yo, you're such a lemming. <laughs> Lemmings to the sea. <laughs> but look how cute they are. Look at that little lemming. Lemmings are small rodents that live in the Arctic tundra. They rely on snow cover for survival in winter, living and breeding under it. It provides insulation and protection from predators such as foxes and owls. Lemmings have a boom-bust population cycle, a rapid growth followed by a decrease, and are an essential food source for Arctic predators like the Arctic foxes and snowy animals. Uh, owls, <laughs> not all animals. Climate change can decrease snow cover melting it away or reducing overall snowfall. This threatens the survival of lemmings and the predators and their young that depend on them. And there's the beluga whale. They're very sociable animals and they are distinguishable by their white skin. And what's happening is that the, the warming in ocean temperatures is opening up the Arctic waters to the shipping like we read. Seismic surveys and military activity for a, 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 a larger proportion of the year. So among other impacts, these activities make the oceans, again, noisier, potentially affecting the whale, the beluga's ability to communicate, navigate, and find food and search for mates. I fucking hate this, Jennifer. <laughs> I'm sorry. The red knot. Beautiful bird, the red knot. Red knots are migratory wading birds who breed in the Arctic. They're often found on UK estuaries as they migrate. Sadly, we don't usually see the birds stunning red plumage in the UK. This tends to be seen in the Arctic 
at their breeding grounds. A study has shown that insects in the Arctic are hatching earlier. Oh, that's our next article. Are hatching mm-hmm. earlier as climate change causes snow to melt earlier. So by the time the red knots chicks hatch, it's not peak insect time and they don't have as much food. And then predators such as Arctic foxes and skuas may also be hunting birds and their nests if loss of snow cover is causing the other prey like lemmings to be scarcer. So it's the web. See, we're seeing the web of life. And next is the big muskox and uh, they are called the what? The wild wonders of Europe. So they're shaggy coat. We all know muskox. They, they, they go and they roam the frozen Arctic in search of moss and lichen. So studies suggest that they are finding it harder to find food as climate changes. They use their noses and legs to dig through the snow to reach food. But with warmer temperatures, rain is falling, then freezing into a hard layer of ice, which is difficult to break through. So more rain may also mean that calves are getting too cold and freezing to death as their coats aren't able to protect them from mass amounts of rain. So you know, pretty... the, the musk ox is one of the animals to survive uh, the end of the last ice age. You know, a lot of those megafauna, right? Like the saber toothed tigers and the cave bears and, you know, the, all, all those, you know, mammoths and things like that. They yeah. all became extinct. This animals from that same period. And he did not well, become extinct last time. We shall see. Now we're going to yeah. segue because in the interest of time, we just wanted to get to the littler guys and uh, Jen, take it away for the littler guys. And this the, is an article from Cyorg. Okay. Very good. So, um, our, just to clarify, are you talking about the spider article? Nope. The climate change brings fires, floods, and moths. We'll go through okay, this one moths. really quick, and then we'll go to the, to the other one, to the okay, uh, spider one. Because we're going to end up, we'll just end up with the spider. Okay. So, climate change brings fires, floods, and moths to Siberia. Best known as a vast cold tundra, Russia's sprawling Siberia region is being transformed by climate change that has brought with it warmer temperatures, forest fires, and growing swarms of hungry moth larvae. Hmm. Spanning millions of square kilometers east to the Urals to the uh, of the Urals to the Pacific Ocean, the area has p- been particularly hard hit this year by extreme weather, which scientists say is a result of global warming. Photographs of wildflowers in local media last month were a rare sight so early in the year, in normally chilly in the normally chilly region. And the ice cream sales were up 30%. Huh, you don't ever think about that. (laughs) Ice cream sales in Siberia. Yeah, really. The winter, (laughs) you just don't think about it. Uh -uh. The winter Uh was the hottest in Siberia since records began 130 years ago. They've only been keeping records for 130 years. It's a pretty new part of the world. Wow. Average temperatures were up to 6 degrees centigrade higher than in the seasonal norms. Then spring came and with it much warmer temperatures. Makarova says April saw some days reach 30 degrees Celsius or higher. Mm -mm -mm. The warmer temperatures didn't just bring wildflowers um, and boosted ice cream sales. Rainfall was up by a third in eastern Siberia, sparking devastating floods that forced thousands to be evacuated, particularly in the town of Tulun and the surrounding area. Huge moths, Mm. swarms of Siberian silk moth, whose larvae eat away at conifer trees in the region forests, have grown rapidly amidst the rising temperatures. The moths are usually inactive during winter and eat in spring, summer, and autumn periods, which are now lengthening. In all my long career as a specialist, I've never seen moths so huge and growing so quickly, said Vladimir Soldotov, a moth expert who warns of tragic consequences for forests. So they're eating the forests. Yeah, they're eating the forests. Yeah. 
the larvae, which are taking over the larger area of the forest, strip trees of their needles and make them more susceptible to forest fires. Ah, the moth has moved 150 kilometers north compared to its usual territory, but that's because of global warming, Soldatov told AFP. In Kronoyskarsk <laughs> region, <Did> that- east- <laughs> I can't say it, eastern Siberia, more than 120,000 trees had to be treated to kill larvae. Oh, treated according with According to the regional, yeah, regional Forest Protection Center. Oh, okay. Do you want to continue this? Sure. It's kind of past the hour. I'll just, okay. I'll, yeah, I'm just going to go down to, to where it just says... Um, I'll, I'll get back on it. We it, it will go quickly here. Uh, they're talking about the bark beetles, and we all know about that because we have bark beetles here. So in 4.8 million hectares in Siberia, okay? And so that's, uh, and then another 1.1 million hectares of high latitude boreal forest. Wow. And this was published, a Greenpeace report on Tuesday. So fires and bark beetles, and we're, they're just screwed up there. Climate change has led the number of forest fires to double in 10 years. Um, it, just, it, just goes, it just goes on and on and on. It says this, the news, okay, the news is not all bad here. The changing nature of Siberia's Where? landscape will att- okay will attract new species of birds and animals. I did read this earlier. Uh, our our steps are getting greener. Our lake uh, our lakes are warming up. Siberia is becoming a more appealing region for animals and for us too. Well, you know that th- th- that's going to be what the propaganda and uh, so yeah. that the, that you can um, avoid talking about. How absolutely freaking fucking horrible everything really is, and what these weather anomalies mean. Hey, you know what? It, it, what if? What if? The, what if it? What if? <laughs> I can't. What if it? So Jennifer, take the next article, the last article, and let's oh, look the at spiders? that absolutely beautiful look at that spider. Cutie. Yep, I, look I'm at that tried cutie. to make it as big as I could. He, he, he look at him, but they're reproducing. Oh, yeah. And those are all eyes along the bottom, too. They have, like, all these different eyes. It's crazy, right? Wild. Climate warming helps Arctic spiders to reproduce at twice. Oh, I think I blew it up too much. At at twice. It doesn't say at twice what, but probably twice the rate, right? All right, wait. Let's see that. Twice the rate. Mm. One of the direct consequences of this big change in temperatures and climate is longer Mm -hmm. summers, more heat, and even longer summers. This threatens many species and upsets certain ecological and biological functions. The shifts in phrenology, i.e. the timing of biological events, are the most widely reported biological response to climate warming. Indeed, warmer conditions could extend the period for reproduction, which may result in phenological shifts that could also be affect that could also affect demography and population dynamics. Oh, demog- yeah. yeah, we're getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> A new study you know, revealed the global warming uh, that the global warming cased a spider baby boom oh wow a spider baby boom actually species such as the wolf spiders are already adapting to warmer conditions in the arctic so the female has to be able to hatch two clutches of offspring during the summer instead of one so they're producing twice as many babies yeah but i wonder if they're a food source let's see because i didn't get through this whole one yeah For this study, the data for wolf spiders goes back almost 20 years, and the researchers in Zackenberg Research Station in northeastern Greenland worked as part of Greenland Ecosystem Monitoring Program. They used small pitfall traps set up in different vegetation types to catch spiders. By looking at the distribution of the number of eggs in the egg sacs throughout the season, the researchers confirmed that the last summers the spiders produced two eggs egg sacs, oh. a common phenomenon in warmer mm. latitudes, but with wow. no precedent in the Arctic until now. That's pretty wild stuff. Yeah. The research I mean, this is what we're going to see. 
Yeah. The research indicates that in the years with earlier snowmelt, first clutches occurred earlier and the proportion of second clutches produced was larger. Like likely females produce their first egg clutch earlier in those years, which allow them time to produce another clutch. Clutch size for the first clutches was correlated to female size. This study provides the first evidence for Arctic invertebrates producing addis additional clutches in response wow. to warming. Moreover, given that wolf spiders are widely distributed, important tundra predator, wow. research researchers expect to see population and food web consequence of their increased productive rates. Well, that ought to be uh, interesting, I think, to, to follow it forever yeah. how long, or, or the research. Well, that was what I was looking for. Will, will eat the larvae. <laughs> well, the that's kind of what I was looking for when I was doing, yeah. you know, looking for stuff online about, well, this kind of thing. So, so we've been on for a uh, an hour and 10 minutes, and we want to look at a couple of your comments. Jennifer, it was a good show. I, I really enjoyed yeah. us, uh, our, our, our picks, you know. I hope I that you too. guys feel that we covered and, and, and enlightened you and the way, you know, we flowed the articles. We hope that you enjoyed it. Um, oh, Jean's here. Hi, Jean. Well, I think that, oh, <laughs> Raza. Jean, I hate spider snakes, slugs, and snails. I guess people are going to, you know what, once you talk about bugs, it starts everybody thinking about bugs. Um, <laughs> so, th guys, thank you then. I, I uh, <laughs> Robert, sorry, but spiders do nothing for me. <laughs> okay. You see, They're very smart. Have you ever smart. watched a spider do his web and just watch their consciousness? They're incredibly the smart. Smartness in a spidery big. sense, just like the, the ants. Yeah. We have the ant holes outside. And I was sitting and just watching them until the torrential rain that we don't usually get washed the whole goddamn thing away. And uh, they're fantastic, too, but I didn't get to, to film it and because we had that torrential rain. And that's another thing. I mean, down here, you know, we're not having any normal stuff. We get like, it's like Florida. It's like it rains in the afternoon. We get torrential rain and downpours. Uh, it's all these different new yeah. animals. Oh, well, yeah. it's happening. We're Ruth, into abrupt climate change now. Here. Put on your seatbelts, guys. Uh, thank it's you, everybody. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah, everybody's uh, thanking us and thanking you. And yeah, it's 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 sobering data all the time, you know. But we bring it, and we do like to talk about. I'm putting up all these comments, but we do like to talk about the Arctic because the Arctic is, is the, it, it's, it's the, it's the top of the world. I mean, it's the, it's like, without your As brain. As goes the you Arctic, do? so goes the world. Just because it's, you know, blistering hot up right? in the Arctic. I mean, that, that whole thing is going to move down, but it's starting there. Yeah. That's where it's most evident. Well, smash the like button, guys. And if you're not subscribed, please subscribe and Remember, uh, I do the show Tuesday and Thursday. I've moved to 9.30 Eastern. And next Sunday at 9 p.m., Jennifer and I have a special guest. Black Bear News will be in the middle of our screens. Yay, and we're going to have Kevin. a really good... Yep, we're going to have a, a, a good uh, discussion and figure out... I said, Kevin, the stream of consciousness can start with you. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, thank you very much uh, for coming, and we hope you enjoyed and learned. Well, enjoy. How can you enjoy some of this stuff? It's hard. But, uh, yeah, it's all grim. Right. It's grim. All right. Yeah, it's grim, but we love you for coming and learning and, and being with us. Thank you very much. I'm going to play the intro video for you guys to finish up your chat. Jennifer, I love you as always. I love uh, you too. And I love our, our, our show together on Sundays. It's great. And thanks, guys. I love it too. It's what we got, thanks. each other. It's yeah. true.